Welcome, everybody. Um, this, this talk that I prepared, I, I call it um, making a future. And m making is something I'm, I'm really, really concerned with. It's, it's like for me, making and creating creativity, it's all like, like one and the same thing, really. Um, and I think, yeah, true, true making, well, making and, and the future are completely linked to each other. It, 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 it's, in, it's our future, it's our world. We, we shape it through our action and our creativity. In other words, I'd, I'd like to, you to keep in mind, um, maybe in this presentation, is this word craft, technology, the issue of local versus the global and its relationship with each other. To, to explain myself a bit, um, this is where, where I worked the last four or five years in France, my, my studio there. And then this is inside. So it's, it's, it's like an explosion, it's like everything is is going on there. And then th this is my new studio in London. Uh, we've got an elephant, as you can see, and uh, very young workers. <laughs> 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 I'll go back to 1997. This has been a few years after I left college um, in London, Royal College. Um, and I, was, I, was, I, I, I had nothing but a lot of ambition um, and, and a lot of energy. And, this, this, this is like, like a kind of a phrase that's always stayed with me, that I, I still use a lot. It's, it's just use what you have. Um, and like one, one thing we, we have a lot in London is empty wine bottles. We've got so much of it. <laughs> because, yeah, Lon well, England is not a wine producing country, so they don't really get recycled enough into new bottles. So you get these huge, huge mountains. And it's like a green mountain, white mountain. They're like separated by color. It's beautiful. But I, I always liked the shape of bottles. And then my wife, Emma, Emma Wolfenden, she's, she's a sculptor. And she works a lot with glass. And she has some machines. So we started taking these bottles and cutting them, sandblasting them, polishing them. And, and through that, changing them. And then we, we, we made like a whole collection of tableware. It's like a jug and glasses. It, this is like, like our grinding machine. Um, this is a new one we, 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 we bought because on the old one, I had a really bad accident. I had to, I almost cut my thumb off, had to go to the hospital and stuff. So we bought this new machine. But it, it's, it's a diamond grinder. It's like a record player. It's like this big. And it's absolutely safe even for me to use. <laughs> um, but yeah. Then, then, then we did a fair, and quite quickly we were starting to sell this all over the world. And we, we started to really run production. Um, this was a studio at that time. It looks like a bomb has gone off in it, but <laughs> it's like the normal state of it. But yeah, it, 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 it kind of made me realize, yeah, the, the whole idea of production or being a factory is, is actually, you, you really don't need very much. So then, yeah, th this became like a whole collection of different, different vessels. After, say, two, three years of making this, we, we were running like almost full-time production, um, which involved me standing behind the grinder all day long, or packing stuff. And I didn't really want to do that anymore. So we, we stopped, and we started to look for somebody else who could make it for us. Now, there, there's a lot of um, glass factories that could do the cutting, the grinding, but they, they would use new bottles. They, they are not set up to, to kind of collect empty bottles, and we didn't like that. So then it, it was like a period of like, two, three years that that's, um, we, we weren't able to produce this. But in, in the end, we, um, we, we, we set up a new glass workshop in Guatemala City. And we, we trained quite young people there to, to um, make, make the glass there. These are people with very little education, um, very little chances. So for them to, to kind of own this, this production workshop is a really big change in their life. But we, we set it up in a way that, that there's hotels, and restaurants around Guatemala City. They collect, they keep the empty bottles, and these, these guys they drive around in a pickup truck and they collect the bottles. At, at kind of similar time, kind of 98, 99, um, I, I went to Milan 
and sort of furniture fair there. And I felt so alienated from it. Everything was so slick and plastic. And I thought, no, th th that's not how I want to live. And besides, this is completely beyond my means. Um, but I, I want to make a collection of furniture for myself. And I used very simple materials, um, like, like really simple wood that's screwed together with plastic sheeting that's taped around it. So very kind of, kind of informal, but always very beautiful, elegant uh, proportions. Like a light that's made of, of fluorescence from an old office. Um, a chair with an old blanket strapped to it. Which is actually, actually a very comfortable chair. And then, then I was asked to, to have an exhibition in, a, in an art gallery with this chair. And I, and I thought, yeah, this... And, and they asked me if I want to sell the chair. And I thought, well, it's a bit stupid because it cost me time to make it, but it's not the chair that's worked very much, really. So it's going to be really overpriced. And actually, it's much nicer to, to let everybody else make it. Um, so then, then I made these diagrams, and they were printed as, as full-size posters. So you, it tells you what wood you need and tools. So you cut the wood, you light on top of the drawing, you screw it together. So you don't need to measure anything, but all the angles come out correct and stuff. So it, it, it's like a system for, for yeah, which, which offers, offers a choice. So in, instead of when you need a chair to go to a shop, you, you can actually make something yourself as well. And I more and more start to realize that that's something that's, that we've completely lost in our society. For a lot of people like, um, amongst us, it's, it's quite normal if we need a table, we make a table. But it's, it's, it's good to get out of the consumerism. And then through yeah, different exhibitions, so the, the project became about information. So in the exhibitions, I made these setups that there were always books on the tables about do it yourself, about cooking, about growing your own vegetables, making your own clothes. Um, and then my daughter, she has her own rough and ready chair. Um, then when, when, when she was born, I, I, I started to, yeah, first of all, spend much more time at home as well. And then, then, then I start to have a, a kind of a, a very different relationship with my home. Um, and, I, and, I, and I felt like, yeah, I want something very warm, very, very loving um, around me for, 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 for my family. Um, and I realized that as, as, as a designer, I always went to art schools where you very automatically were taught not to decorate. And then, so, so to, to think about it, I spent a lot of time at the Victorian Albert Museum looking at things that were made before the Industrial Revolution and kind of really liking that, that kind of sensuality and the craftsmanship. But at the same time, I also wanted to make things that are, yeah, for now, for me, for today. Um, and as, as we lived on the edge of this park, there were always a lot of crows there. And I took one of these rough and ready chairs and made this cover and hand embroidered this crow on it as, as a kind of act, a kind of, kind of act of vandalism against modernism in a way. And th this, this was, completely changed my, my, my thinking. Once that crow was on the chair, then I, I knew everything is possible. There, there's no boundaries anymore. Um, and I, again, I, ma I made this collection, of the, which I called the Wednesday Collection. It's, it's like, like I called it Wednesday because Wednesday is kind of midday, every day, kind of nothing special about a Wednesday kind of day. <laughs> um, and I, I, I like working in collections because it, it, it very clearly shows a much much larger idea than only making one chair or one table, but putting them together, it, it starts to talk more about philosophy behind it. Um, so some of the pieces we have here is, is a table that's got 3,000 nails hammered into it. And I quite like, like that, that kind of sense of, sense of madness in it as well, like, like you go crazy. Um, the, the silk is cut with a laser, but very badly, so it's very burnt on the edges. Um, yeah, and th that's, that screen, you can also cut it up and use it as a party decoration in your room if you don't want a curtain anymore. Um, there's this chair with more embroidery. So no, no, not, nothing is like embroidered perfectly. It's all done by me and very deliberately with, with the imperfections into it. The, the table is um, CNC punched, so that's very industrial. Um, and then the rest is, is just like an accident.
but it adds color. Um, so like like this chair as well. It's all everything is is made more more a bit with love and than than kind of skill in a way. Some glass made. There's dragonflies and lilies in the pattern. Um, and then I also designed the lights, which first was the garnet light and later become became the, the well the Wednesday light and the, became the garnet light. The, the, this light is, is photo edge, so th this is designed on the computer, um, whereas at the same time I was embroidering by hand. But I, I, I like having the, the the dialogue of the two. So this is made out of a flat sheet of steel, which is an incredibly um, industrial process, like a printing process. That makes it possible to, to produce it for extremely low costs, um, but with yeah incredible incredible detail into it. Um, and when when I was at the Victorian Albert Museum, I, I I loved the very detailed, highly ornamental, say metal work. But I realized that those were yeah really labored over by teams of craftspeople for months on end, and and therefore extremely high costs. Only like the king or the baron could afford them. And I, and I like that, that with, with this industrial process, we can make something that's so detailed that you can't actually make it by hand anymore, this thing. And it's completely democratic as well. And then on, on, on the other side, um, kind of, kind of, I started to work with, with companies and industries. Um, Ilse Crawford is here. She saw the Wednesday light and she asked, she was then working as an art director for Swarovski. She asked me if I wanted to design a chandelier, which, yeah, the Blossom Chandelier is, is, is my new interpretation of, of a traditional chandelier. But again, it's, it's got this longing for nature into it. The Bridge Council asked me if I was interested to work with a group of women in, in Rio de Janeiro um, called Copahaca. And it, it, this is a collective of, of women um, who, who do, do textile and needlework together, a fantastic kind of crochet work. So I, w I went there and I liked it, and and I and I thought, yeah, I, w I would like to design a chandelier for these people as well that they can make because a chandelier is like a light, um, which it, it's it's good if it takes a lot a lot of labor, so they get paid a lot, and something we're used for for paying more for anyway. So it it's kind of works in that system. So again, with with very simple or no tooling, like like a um, a gym ball. Um, and then the crochet, the flowers. Because we, we make these chandeliers, and they, they, these are very colorful, like like the the carnival in Rio, of course. But then you also have yeah the the, the darker the underside of Rio as well, and the black chandelier. And then yeah the the, the romance, the hope, in in the white color. And I, and I worked with an American company, again, m much more industrial, um, a light made out of paper, uh, called the Midsummer Light. Um, th this is quite new light. It's again made in steel, uh, called Future Flora. And they're like, like kind of hybrid flowers, lights, metal, weird things. Um, but in, in the production of those lights, there, there was quite a lot of offcuts, and then I designed this, this small piece of jewel, jewelry um, that could be made out of the offcuts of the lights, so it, it helps bring the cost down. Um, the problem now is that we, we sell too much of the jewelry, so we don't have enough waste. So, <laughs> so now, now I should design a really small light that I can make out of the waste of the jewelry or something. At, at that time, also, then the biggest commercial thing was a project we did with Target in America. This is a television advert for that. My name is Tord Bouwentje. I've created a magical world for you. Come celebrate the season with me at Target. Okay, so that went out all over America. Um, and that, that, that's completely the other extreme. So both things go on in the studio, the, like the project in Rio and then the project with Target. Um, and I, I, I like having that, 
the dialogue as well. And like what I learned in, on one side about, about craft or about people, about cities, I, I can use it in another side as well. Um, but st still with this idea of yeah, using what you have, lo looking around carefully what is there, um, I think it applies on this project where we, we were asked, fol following the trans class, the trans class was set up in Guatemala City um, with, with help from an organization called Aid to Artisans. And that, that became commercially very successful as well. And but based on that, they, they came back to us and, and asked if, 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 I, if I could think about these, these ceramic cooking pots that are made in Colombia in the La Chamba area. Um, it was the, the, the problem with these pots is that well, they, 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 they've been made for hundreds and hundreds of years, the same pots, but they get copied now by other people um, outside Colombia, other areas as well. And the, who can make these pots cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So they have to produce more and more for less and less money. So it's like this downward spiral. So here, here the question was, like, can, can we use design to change, to break out of this spiral? So th this is where, where they're making these pots. So th th there, there's no tooling involved. They're, they're shaped by hand, like that, out of clay, which they dig up of th their local river. Th they're like in the middle of the jungle there in Colombia. Then the, the clay is, is then dried outside in the sun for two, three days. And then with a the very smooth stone, they're rubbed until they're completely smooth, smoothly polished on the outside. And they, they, they do, in the whole village, you see them doing this everywhere. Um, and then they're fired, again, very low tech, um, just in an oil drum for six or eight hours, low temperature. Um, but it, 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 it works, and it's been working like that for hundreds of years, which is fantastic. Um, but then if, if we, if we really start looking at these pans, they're, they're also designed to cook on a fire. They have these handles with the holes that you put a chain, hang it above your cooking fire. Um, the, the, the thing on the top is very awkward, small, to lift the lid up. Um, and if, if they're full with like, like a soup or something, or stew, um, they're, they're very awkward to hold. They, they feel like they fall out of your hands. So then I, I start to rationalize the shape a little bit. So I turned the handles down so that it feels like it's really secure in your hands. We made a better uh, fitting for the lid and the, and the base. And then with, with very simple templates, um, kind, of, kind of communicated with, with the artisans in La Chamba to, 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 to develop the shapes. Then there's, there's like a frying pan as well that uses the same lid again, and they all nest on top of each other. But then, then I also want, wanted to try and find a different way, not only by changing the shape and the functionality, but also the, the, way, the way it looks as well, um, to, to differentiate these from, from, from their copies. And I, and I did these tests in my studio where, where I collected some leaves and then you press them into the clay and it leaves this, this kind of mark. Um, so then, with, with again, very basic drawings, basically illustrating that wh whatever you do, it, it doesn't matter. It's always, it's always beautiful, but that simple idea you need to somehow explain as well. Um, so th they collect leaves as well there, because they, yeah, they, they, they live in the middle of the forest there. And then th they get applied. So there, there, there was a period of kind of testing this. And then after it's fired, the, the leaves burn away, and it leaves these kind of fossils. Um, and then, yeah, they, they, they learn how to make it. Here you see the relation of the pans next to each other very well. What, what I like here a lot is that although these people um, have been making this for hundreds of years, so sometimes if you look from the outside of the situation, you can actually see ways of, of doing things different. Um, without adding any tooling or complexity to, to, to the process. Um, and be because the, these pots looks, look very much like, like cauldrons to me, like witches' cauldrons, I call this collection the Witch's Kitchen, and I designed this logo for Flaming Cat to go with it. Um, and then, again, with the women in, in Rio, we, we made some aprons, because if you, if you cook, you need to look nice as well. So this is the witch's apron. We made gloves so you can actually hold these pans. So there were witches' gloves, and these are the wizard 
gloves um, made in Argentina with sustainable leather, um, and really good Frankenstein stitching. Yeah, testing top models. <laughs> And then, yeah, and then, like, 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 Erwan says, the, the, the photography at the end is, is really the last part of the project that you need to do to really communicate the whole project. You, you see some wooden utensils here as well um, that, that are wood carved in in Guatemala, uh, really in the jungle. So we we email drawings to to, to the guy of the trans class workshop. He takes them to the bus station. The bus drives three hours into the jungle. And then, like a week later, the bus comes back with some carved models, which is a nice, slow way of working. <laughs> um, and the lid can be used upside down as well, as surfing plates. Um, these are called salad surfers. They're called um, extra hands. <laughs> okay. It's my friend Renata. She's the most witchy looking of my friends. <laughs> with, with making that there's this sense of yeah tradition and, and technology how, how the two like like in the La Chamba project there, there's a lot of tradition of course um, in, in, in this following project which we did with Nani Makina a Spanish um, carpet rug company they, they asked me to design a rug and I thought yeah but, but I mean I like rugs a lot because the floor is my favorite bit of furniture in the house it's like, yeah, you start the evening, you sit on the chair, then you move to the sofa and bigger, but you always end up lying on the floor. <laughs> it's just the biggest place, the most comfortable. So what's nice to lie in a, a little field of flowers, I thought. So then with, with die cutting, these, these flower shapes are, are cut out of felt. And then on this very big loom in India, they're then yeah, in, in, in the normal weaving process, inserted um, in, in the warp. And then, but, but besides inserting these, they, they weave the carpet like they do a normal traditional carpet. And then, yeah, this is the way it comes out, the way it looks. So then it's, yeah, different colors. And it's really like, like a little field of flowers in the end. But again, th this, this, yeah, the carpet making has been done for hundreds or thousands of years, maybe. And by, by using the technology of the die cutting from another place um, and bringing the two together, we, we get this really surprising new result. So it's, it's all still about making, but then it's also ab about exposure. You, you don't want to make things in isolation. They, they, they need to go out in the world, especially if they're like, like more experimental projects that, that don't have a a commercial driver behind them. It, it, it's about communicating the things. So si since, since quite early on, I've, I've been making these installations, exhibitions. Um, this was, for example, the British Council in Prague had this gallery. The, the, the building was built as an old car sales showroom. So they had these big windows where they could put cars. But then when it became the office for the British Council, they, they started using this as a gallery space. And then th this is where I first showed the, the the Wednesday collection, um, which then later showed in London as well. So th this was a, a derelict butcher shop that we found. Um, and through through those exhibitions, I kind of got, got in contact with with Moroso, Italian furniture company, who I who asked if if I want to do a show with them and start designing furniture with with them which I, I've been doing since 2004. Um, and pr pr probably a bit like, like the Burlex as well. I'm, I'm not very keen to have kind of too, too many different clients. I like having like one client in each kind of product category. Um, I, I like designing loads of different things. Um, but like, like with Morose, it's very nice to, to know, okay, if I do furniture, it's with them and that's it. Um, and it, 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 it builds a relationship where you start to learn a lot from each other as well. And then, yeah, Patricia Moroso, the lovely Patricia, she um, has, has a strong relation with, with Senegal. Um, her, her husband is, is from there, and there, there, there's this fantastic technique um, in, 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 in Senegal, um, 
you, 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 might, you probably have something similar here as well, where, where furniture is made by, by making a steel frame, and then on the frame you weave a, a kind of skin on, on, the, on the frame. Um, we, we, we thought it would be nice to make garden furniture like this, because it's very durable. Um, so my, my idea was to, was to make these kind of sun loungers that you could play in the garden, but th they could also make like a shadow. So I designed like, like a, this is called a sunny lounger, and then the shadowy chair. Um, and yeah, as, as you see here, this is, this is production in Senegal. Um, all the, the whole frame is, is built up out of, out of single curved piece of steel. Um, if we would make this in Italy, I, I would have designed it in a different, because there we can use a CNC machine to, to do three-dimensional tube bending, uh, completely controlled. But here, in, in the whole, this is Salam, this is Patricia's husband. Um, th this is the metal workshop um, that we're working with, which is fantastic. It's got two hammers and a welder, and um, it's great. But on this table, there's these formers. That, that's where the steel is formed around. So because of that, very yeah, basic setup. And frames are made. So we we look, work on patterns here. These are designs for patterns. Th these are the yarns, which is um, a, a, a polyethylene yarn that they normally make uh, fishing nets out of. So they, they come in these very bright industrial colors. Um, here you see the weaving in process. And this is how we communicate with the people there. We were prototyping some new pieces as well, footstool and a dining chair at that moment. So it goes through sketches like this, very, very, very simple, very direct way of communicating. And then, yeah, we get some steel start bending. And a few hours later, there's a chair standing there, which we can test. And then 20 people can come and all say something about it. And <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the crew there and then yeah a few days later when it's done stool and then yeah again we, we spent a lot of time kind of taking pictures of these chairs uh, I, I like this one this, this this looks like it's photographed somewhere here in africa but it's actually kind of in the north of italy <laughs> in, in the autumn yeah. so there yeah, they're, they're really like beautiful places to sit in the garden with. Another part of, of making is, is and this tradition is, is as, as a designer to, 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 to use our imagination of fantasy, um, which and I'd, I'd like to illustrate with this project as well. It's, it's, it's called the Fig Wardrobe, which I made for, for a London-based company called Meta. Um, this, this wardrobe is started as, as a paper model. Um, it's, it's, it's like 1 to 10 scale, kind of tiny. It's made by hand in the studio. And it's, it, I, I, I made it to, to explain to the different craftspeople what it should be like in the end. Um, so here, um, this is a workshop in Paris where, where the tree that's in the middle of the wardrobe is being carved. Um, yes, the carving. So it's yeah, really fantastic skill. And it's carved to then make a mold uh, so that later the tree can be cast in, in bronze. Um, meanwhile, in England, the, the leaves are all made, cut by hand, chased, uh, details stamped into them. Enamel is painted by hand. Kind of each leaf is like six hours of painting, firing. Now you see the different stages of the enamels going through. Um, and then in France, there's this workshop where they make the, the, the frames for the doors. And where, where each point where the leaves need to be attached needs to end up in the correct position. So on, on, the, on that side, there's this big three-dimensional three map kind of mapping out where all the leaves need to go. So each leaf is numbered. So it can be assembled back. And then, yeah, and then the end result is, is really stunning as well. Um, so, yeah, the leaves, I mean, the, the, the sense of quality. Um, but in, in, in my 
kind of when when they asked me when I showed them the design of the, of the thick wardrobe, they asked me what what material how do you want to make it, and I said well. I think enamel can be really nice with very beautiful, intense colors. And I've seen beautiful enameled jewelry at the Victorian Albert Museum, um, which I really love, but not realizing that the biggest piece of enamel was like this big, well, each leaf and then having so many of these, it was like a bit of impossible demand, but they went for it. This door handle opens, detailing. So on the inside you have this tracery and then yeah, this is the wardrobe. Okay. Okay. And then, thanks. Um, now, th th this is a word I like a lot, experiment. Um, I say twice, because I, I really like it. Yeah. Um, this is, this is um, a, a project um, that I've been working on for the last two, three years um, with, with a, uh, the design center in Philadelphia, who, who have one of the largest collections of, of lace, of Quaker lace in America. They invited me to come and look at their, at their archive. And then after that, we, we talked about doing this exhibition together with Demarcus Van and Carl Lane, a Canadian artist, who are also very interested in lace. And I, and I realized that, yeah, a lot of my work is, is lace-like, but it's always about cutout. Whereas lace is really about, about constructing something with, with yarn, with fiber. And, and, and it's, it's actually yeah, technically completely different, but it's interesting to really start thinking about. So I, I, I went back home, and I, but after spending like three days in the archive looking at this beautiful lace, I didn't really want to make textile lace because I didn't want to be compared immediately to all the beautiful things I'd seen. So I, I took grass. We've got plenty of grass outside the studio. So I started making kind of my, my own lace out of grass. And um, kind, of, kind of lots of different experiments. There, there, there's, it's like a tiny village with only 3,000 people. And there's not much to do. But one of the things you can do on a Thursday night is go to the lace making club. And um, so the, these two girls, they, they did that for, for two years already when this project started. So they were completely happy to work on the lace project. And, um, well, all the old ladies in the village as well. So they often came <laughs> drinking tea in the studio. Um, but, um, yeah, we, we kept kind of, kind of thinking. And, and I was very interested as well in, in the whole idea of, of translating the lace into something more three-dimensional. That stops being flat. This was a light we made. And then, yeah, it's, it's a lot of these tests are, are very much like jewels in a way. Um, we, we decided let, let's make some real jewelry as well. So this is made out of raffia, different necklaces, bracelets, hats. And then we, we made a whole dress in the end. And then more, more things for, for the exhibition, we, we, we made this, this sample of, of lace, which we sent to Philadelphia students there from the university. They, they made a big curtain um, for the gallery, um, kind, of, kind of starting on, on this. I, I, I got quite fascinated by, by, by spider webs as well. This was a beautiful one I saw on a frosty morning um, in the forest. As, 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 as this, this kind of yeah, lace made by nature. And I, and I thought, yeah, that would be fantastic to, to, if you could sit in that, if you were really small. And, um, so let, let, let's try and make this, this kind of spider web. So, we're, 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 we started with, with these models, and then I imagined, yeah, if, they're, if they would be really big, you, you could sit in it. So then, yeah, we, we built this sofa in, in the studio. You see the, the little model there on the left? And then, yeah, it's in progress. So then, the, the samples, they, they all came together um, as, as part of the exhibition of showing this, this process as well. Um, and, and then, then we made this table, so it's really like, like a museum. And suddenly, th these things that are really like nothing, they, they suddenly become very precious as, as, as thoughts. And then the, there's different lights made out of grass and raffia. And then you see, oh, there, there's a film projected about, uh, about yeah, th this dress in the forest, and the dress is yeah, hanging there in the show. Th this is the curtain which they 
made there, which is fantastic because it's all it's completely different because so many different people worked on it. And then yeah, this is how the sofa came out. So all, all different kind of bindings <coughs> together. So yeah, and that, that's that's like my, my last kind of very experimental, kind of more independent projects. But I, I always have, have a strong feeling that that's yeah, my my barometer is, is kind of do, do I enjoy what I'm doing, and n normally I I can feel very well if I if I have fun if I enjoy myself I know that, that the projects are going in the right direction, and. Um, I want to end by wishing you all very much success here in South Africa. Thanks.